Um, good morning, Allison. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning, young people, and good morning, friends. Uh, brothers and sisters, do you remember when you decided to be baptized? Well, Ali shared with me that last year she was in a car accident. And the significance of what that could have meant was one of the things that made her reevaluate her life. At some point, all of us who have been baptized either had an event in our life or it may have been a growing realization that made us stop and consider. Either way, we started to consider our current path, the depth of our belief, our conviction, and what we truly want and desire. In our first principle and uh, review classes with Allison, one of the themes that we kept going back to was the relationship that God speaks about that he seems to have had with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It says in Genesis chapter 3 that the Lord God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and looking for Adam and Eve. And it, it describes this intimate relationship that they had where they spoke with him and he spoke with them. And this is the relationship that God brings up frequently throughout scripture, where he says, uh, they shall be my people and I will be my God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. This is the central point to which God's revealed purpose is with this earth, to fill it with his glory, as he says in a number of passages throughout the Bible. And that, and that purpose is um, in us to fill it with people who bear his name and glorify him in their life and purpose. And this is one of the principles that really made sense to Ali in our classes. And we could see was a genuine desire for her and a motivation for her to be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, to be a part of that purpose, uh, to be forgiven of her sins, to have that relationship with God now and in the kingdom. And this morning, we have the opportunity to witness this symbol in her actions. Because her baptism is a symbol. It's a symbol of the way of life she has already been trying to live. It's a symbol of the way of life she will continue to live. And this baptism is a symbol of the hope she has of being raised to life should she fall asleep in Jesus before he returns. And speaking of the relationship that was lost because of sin... We looked at how with Adam and Eve, it was voluntary. It was a choice that they made to disobey God's rule. And in direct comparison and contrast, Jesus voluntarily denied the desires of his flesh, even the desire for self-preservation, which we read about in Matthew chapter 22. In verse 44, it says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground because he struggled with the decision. What his human heart told him was at war with, with, with what the mind of the spirit was telling him. And we know this because it says in verse 42, Jesus says, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. And here is the choice he makes. Here is the voluntary submission. Here is the denial of the flesh when he says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And this is exa the example we see in baptism this morning. As Ali will go under the water, it is a symbol of her putting her flesh, her desires, her human nature to death. And being raised out of the water, it's a symbol of her putting on Jesus' thinking the mind of the spirit, so that her actions, like her Lord Jesus, were to glorify God and not herself. So when she comes out of the water then, makes us ask the question, is her human nature actually dead? I think we, we know the answer is no, because we can all agree temptation is going to arise soon enough. And that is what the symbol is there for. It's to remind us when we are tempted. The full sensory experience of depriving ourselves of air to breathe is to remind us the temptations and desires we have are not what will save. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ will. In Colossians 2, it says that we are buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised 
uh, with him through faith in the working of God. Making a faithful decision, one that glorifies God, one that puts God's will in place of our own is what pleases him in the end. So 19 years ago, I remember when Rob and Julie had a newborn baby, Allison Grace Huck. And just as we rejoiced then over the birth of a wonderful daughter, the family of the Hucks, we rejoice again today with the angels in heaven who have been watching over her all these years. And now as Allison is being about to be born again through baptism into the family of God. So Allison, as you are being baptized, this is a symbol of how you are already and will continue to live, denying the desires of your heart and flesh, and instead living your life to glorify God. This baptism, as you go under the water and come up, is a symbol for you of being made alive together with Jesus, and that God forgives you of your sins. This is a moment for you to remember. For the rest of us, as we witness this confession of faith, this answer of a good conscience towards God, do our lives reflect the meaning of this symbol? Are we walking in newness of life? Are we united together in the likeness of Jesus' death? Do we consider ourselves dead to sin? Or does sin reign in our mortal bodies? Now is the time for us to reevaluate and remember our baptism. Remember what event or growing realization led us to get there. Our faith and desire to please him. So as we watch this rebirth, let us consider the succinct words of the Apostle Paul of the hope that Allison will now share in. In Romans 6, it says, But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Good morning, dear Alison and um, family and uh, brothers and sisters, young people and friends. 2001 was a very exciting year for you, Rob and, uh, and Julie, with the birth of Alison. But it was also quite an exciting year for us, for Lois and myself, because I decided that um, I would have a change of employment. And my new form of employment was going to be what is called retirement. But of course, as we all realize in the service of the Ecclesia and the service of the Lord, there is no such thing as retirement. So we moved from Chatham to Paris at the end of 2001 and early in 2002, we elected to join the Cambridge, uh, the Kitchener Waterloo Ecclesia because it was the smaller of the two Ecclesias in this particular location at that time. And at that time, uh, Rob and Julie, you were members of Kitchener Waterloo. And we remember very well coming to your home in Christopher Drive for Bible classes. And Alison, at that time, you would have been a little girl of 12, 15 months old. And of course, you were tucked up in bed when we had our Bible classes and enjoyed each other's company in your home at, at, on Christ Christopher Drive. And now here we are again, 19 years later, enjoying another birth for you, Alison. It's how you've responded to the call of the gospel, how you have responded to the invitation to eternal life. And you have made a choice about your eternity. And that choice is very, very significant. And yet choices that are made by people, by nations are also just as significant. And indeed, nations themselves make choices, perhaps not about their eternity, though in some regards it might be, but about their future. And the nation of Israel, of course, is no different. In our readings in the past number of couple of months, we've been reading about the history of the, the judges of Samuel and, of course, King Saul. And we've come this morning to the sad death of King Saul. And yet... Israel, as a nation, wanted to be like the nations around them and made a decision about their future. 
about their choice. They made a choice for themselves. And when Samuel was old, they came to him and said, your boys aren't like you, Samuel. They turned aside to dishonest gain. Uh, they took bribes, they perverted justice, and the people had no confidence that Samuel's sons would follow in the way that was right as Samuel had done. So they said, um, give us a king. And the key point, brothers and sisters, is that in requesting a king, they wanted to be like the nations that were around them. They wanted to copy the nations. And oddly enough, they didn't go to the book of Deuteronomy in relation to asking for a king, because in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17, uh, the Moses there, or the Lord speaking through Moses, says that, yes, Israel is going to have a king. It'd be somebody of the Lord's choice, and there are certain factors about the selection of that king but the people when they went to Samuel didn't say well on the basis of what Moses had said we would like a king to be our leader no they wanted to be like the nations that were around them and yet in many ways too many ways they had already been like the nations that are around them they had elected to follow their ways of idolatry child sacrifice and they had gone through the cycle of different generations in the times of the judges when they were in captivity and the Lord raised up a deliverer for them and they were delivered and prospered and only to go through the cycle again. And yet Israel was called to be a light to the nations, a light to the world, a nation that would be attractive to other nations so that they would recognize that the Lord was in their life, in their government and in the ways they would operate. And in their coming to Samuel to request this king, Samuel, of course, personally felt rather rejected, but the Lord said, Samuel, they really have rejected me. It is not you so much that they have rejected. And yet all this request, this granting of a king, was in the providential plan of the Almighty that was making its slow progress through the ages of mankind. And so Samuel gives them due warning about what this king would do, what he would take, the best of their crops, the best of their people. He would take them, he would demand them, which is really quite a contrast to their life under the kingship of the God of heaven, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, because the nation under the kingship of the Almighty, it was an offering that the people were required to give. Very often a free will offering that was required. And although the people would have no choice about what the king would do, the requirement, of course, was still that they should serve the Lord their God. And so Saul was selected, yes, by divine appointment through Samuel, and his purpose was to be a shining light in the nation. He was to lead them against the Philistines to deal with this, this enemy that was nothing but a pricking briar under the, in their sides, that was always a challenge to their well-being and their prosperity. And yet we look at Saul and we see him as an enigma. His name, interestingly enough, means asked for. And one wonders if his father and mother, his father Kish, um, had, uh, did pray for a son. And if they did indeed, their prayer was answered and they were given this son and was who was given the name of Kish. And when we look at the reign of Saul, there are some really quite outstanding aspects about his reign. There's no reference, no hint of idolatry at all in his operation, in his worship. He was very careful about the ritual requirements of the law of Moses about eating meat from slain animals. He built altars, obviously for the purpose of worship. So we find in, in Saul, aspects of his character that were really very good, that really were on, on the right path to indeed eternity and it, eternal life. And so he started so well 
And it was in with wisdom that he dealt with the problem of the Ammonites who were coming to Jabesh Gilead across on the east side of the River Jordan. And it was Saul who raised the zeal of the nation to go and combat their enemies and did very well and succeeded. And when he was challenged about it, and when others were, when the challenge was raised about those who objected to Saul being king, he said, no, 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 this has been a deliverance from the Lord, from the God of heaven, from Yahweh. We will, we will be blessed and we will rejoice in these things. And Samuel was still his guide. Samuel, now older, more infirm, was his guide and gave him specific instructions about what he was to do with a, in a battle, particular battle with the Philistines and said, now Saul, I will come in seven days. We will worship together. Then you will go and fight the Philistines. And without doubt, the hint was that the Lord will give you victory. Well, sadly, Samuel came a little later than seven days. How much we don't know whether it was later on the seventh day or whether it was the eighth day we're not told but Saul was in fear and trembling he was uncertain his soldiers were fearful as well and they were running away going back home not sure as to what was going to happen and Saul took upon himself the role that was reserved for those of the tribe of Levi he elected to be a priest on behalf of his people, his soldiers, not trusting that Samuel was going to arrive in time to bless them before they engaged the Philistines in battle. And Saul is duly reprimanded for this. He's told that he has been unfaithful. He broke faith as we read this morning in that chapter in, um, in Chronicles. He broke faith with the Lord, and we see this other side of the uh, character of Saul, that somehow he was unable to rise to the occasion of trust. But his reign continued, but it wasn't until he failed to obey the instruction of Samuel concerning the Amalekites and Agag that things really did change. He'd already been told that his reign would come to an end and that another king would be appointed and that after he had disobeyed Samuel's words concerning the Amalekites and Agag, uh, he was told that indeed there will be no dynasty for him. None of his sons would sit upon his throne and he was told most emphatically that the Lord would raise up a man who was after God's own heart and he would lead the people. Try to imagine Saul's reaction to this. It's quite evident that Saul had a measure of pride. He'd been exalted to this position in the land of Israel and had started so well had become quite popular among his people. And now he'd been given this public rebuke. And suddenly it seems that to him, his life was, as we would say, falling apart. And imagine his concern, the niggling in his mind. Well, who is this man that's going to be anointed? Who is this man that God sees that's better than me? And he would start being suspicious about all those who were around him, all those who might come to his attention. And in due course, of course, we realized that it was the young man, that teenager from Bethlehem, who had been anointed, unknown to Saul, of course, who comes to the fore so dramatically in, second, first, in, in, in 1 Samuel 17, and kills the great enemy Goliath and one gets the sense that quite quickly Saul realized who Samuel had been talking about and who was the one who had been anointed to take his place.
But Saul's task was not only to be a, a shining light in the nation of Israel and to lead them in the way of worship, he was also to help them destroy the Philistines and to overcome them. And yet, brothers and sisters, it was the Philistines who overcame Saul. It was the Philistines who brought about his death, as we've read this morning in 1 Chronicles chapter 10. And when you think about it, although Saul started so well, he never did bring the Ark of the Covenant back to a focal point of worship among the people. It was neglected all the days of his reign. And it wasn't until David's reign, when David was in Jerusalem, that he brought it and it became the focal point of worship for all the people. And so we see that the enigma of Saul is something that is worthy of thought for us. Whether we are younger or older, we see in him an example of a life that leads us to contemplate the wisdom of obedience to the word of God. And yet we see Saul as a man who is considerate. He's willful. He's deceptive. Yet he's courageous. He's sly. He's violent. He's humble. He's proud. He's a man who is obsessed and he's fearful and lonely. And he dies that sad, miserable death on the hills of Gilboa, as we have read. And yet, even in the declaration that he was not to be the king of Israel, even in the declared purpose of God that somebody else would reign in his stead and his obsession to kill that man whom God appointed. It's most interesting the opportunity that is given to him. Take your Bibles and open them to 1 Samuel chapter 26. There's a, just a little snippet in these words that give us a clue of what Saul might have done and even what he might have become. The occasion is when Saul has chased David and he's fallen asleep in the camp and David has taken his bottle and his, um, and, and, his, and, and his spear and is waking up um, Saul and Abner and the others. And this is what he says to, to, to Saul. Pick up the, thread, the record at verse 17. And Saul knew David's voice and said, is this thy voice, my son David? And David said, it is my voice, so my Lord, O King. And he said, wherefore dost my Lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done and what evil is in mine hand? Now, therefore, I pray thee, let my Lord, the King, hear the words of his servant. If the Lord have stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it be the children of men, cursed they be before the Lord. Do you see that, that those words there that David speaks? If the Lord have stirred up thee against me, let him accept an offering. What David is saying to the king is, if you feel that the Lord has caused you to chase me, make an offering, repent, because there is forgiveness. And if only Saul could have risen to this occasion and followed this, this, this word of encouragement from his son-in-law, David, the end of Saul would have been so, so different. And yet he wasn't. The course of his thinking the course of his character really prevented him from taking this course of action of repentance and seeking forgiveness at the hand of the Almighty. So the Philistines are coming against Israel and this, this, this battle that we've read this morning in 1 Chronicles 10 is not just some border skirmishes which would had happened so often. In fact, the Philistine army had gathered themselves together. They had gone up the seaboard of the Mediterranean Sea and gone to Gilboa, which is in the area of Jezreel. 
And it would seem that this Philistine army could go wherever they wanted to in Israel without any fear of opposition. And by this time, Samuel had been dead for several years. And there's no prophet to guide him. No prophet had been appointed in Samuel's place. Many of the priests Saul had killed in a fit of rage after David had been helped at Nob. And Saul is fearful. He's lonely. He's without divine guidance as a consequence of his pattern of behavior. And we see this tragic picture of him in 2 Samuel of in the middle of the night going to this witch in Endor seeking guidance as to what would happen on the following day in battle. A man who was utterly desolate, uncertain and fearful. And try to imagine brothers and sisters how Saul felt after he had those words from Samuel from the lips of the Almighty that the following day he and his sons would die in the battle. How he would go back to the troops. The following morning when the light dawned, what words of encouragement could he have for the troops? What, what, what words of encouragement could he have for his own boys? So unlike, say, Jehoshaphat, when he went against his <clears throat> God's enemies with words of encouragement to them to trust in the Almighty, Saul could not have done that because he had followed a path that brought about this downfall. And when we read about the kings of Israel who sat upon, some, some of them sat upon the throne of David in Jerusalem, there were 21 of them in, in Jerusalem. And in the northern tribes, there were also 21 kings, eight dynasties, and quite a number of those kings died a very brutal death. And <clears throat> They died an ignominious, ignominious death, rather like that of Saul. And if someone said to you, well, Saul is the first king of Israel, who is the last? I think probably naturally speaking, we think of Hoshea in the north, who was taken off into Assyria, and Zedekiah in the south. But in fact, brothers and sisters, and Alison, he, he, they weren't Israel's last king. Because many, many years later, the people cried out through the mouth of their leaders, we have no king but Caesar. And it almost seems as though things had taken a full turn in the history of Israel from them asking to be for a king to be like the nations that were around them. Finally, they have their own king, not of their own people, but a king who ruled in Rome and who managed the affairs of God's land with an iron rod. And indeed to pacify the anger of the people's leaders, King Caesar did what those leaders wanted. And yet dear brothers and sisters, there's something much deeper in this story of Saul, the story of us, story of the kings of Israel. You see, Saul's real king was someone else. It was the king he was born with. And in Romans chapter 6, which is so often read on occasions like this, when somebody is baptized, we read about King Sin whose slaves naturally we are. And Brother Thomas puts it very beautifully in Elpis Israel in that section, the constitution of sin, when he says that the scriptures use the word sin in two senses. First of all, they use the word sin in the sense of a noun. That is for what we are, what we are born with, the nature of with what we are born. And all of us born, of, born into this world have this nature. It is sin in the noun sense. But there is also sin in the verb sense, relating to the things we do. And truly, if we all admit that king sin in the noun sense of the word is within all of us. And as Brother Steve mentioned in his remarks before your baptism, Alison, your nature doesn't change any more than it has for the rest of us. And But yet we realize that 
the impulses that we have in our nature compel us to do the things when we worship and become slaves of King Sin. And the Lord Jesus Christ was also born, as we know, with this same nature. But he is unique. He managed it. He controlled it. So the question is for us, for you, Alison, today, how can this king that is within us, how can it be mastered? Again, take your Bibles, go to an earlier passage in the scriptures to the book of Deuteronomy. These are the words of the Almighty through Moses that are so relevant to the story of Saul and to the story of ourselves. It's Deuteronomy chapter 17 we want to go to, and we want to pick up the words of encouragement that are, that are, that are given here. And if you just glance at chapter uh, uh, 14, 15, it speaks about the time when Israel will want to have a king. And there's certain rule, points of guidance in verse 16 about horses and wives in verse 17. But take a look at verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 18. It shall be when he, this is the king, sits upon the throne of his kingdom. He shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which he <clears throat> is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and to keep all the words of this law, and these statutes to do them. I think it's safe to say that Saul never did that. If he had, there would have been a, such a different outcome, a different result of his life. And the principle applies to all of us today. It is by doing the things that... Uh, Moses has outlined here that we can master this king's sin that is within us, that has been born within us. We don't have to write it out today. We have it in print before us, but the principle of reading from it every day is so important. <clears throat> and we cannot stress enough that all of us, and you, Alison, should mold your character in your youth according to the great principles that are in the scriptures and read the soul, read the scriptures every day, because it's the key to being faithful. And sadly, Saul was not faithful and perished. And Saul chose his eternity being governed by the passions of his nature, by the weakness that he had. And although he was called to be a light over his people, over the years that light became so dim, it went out and was extinguished in darkness. And there are many lessons for us here in the life of Saul to be remembered. And yet there's something even greater than this for us to realize is that in the lives of <clears throat> all those we read about in the scriptures who are kings in Israel, the king's sin that is within all of us, there is yet a greater king. And that is the one whom the book of Revelation describes as the king of kings. And Jesus mastered the king's sin because he dedicated himself to doing the things we've read about in Deuteronomy chapter 17. And that was the strength of his spiritual mind. And although Saul and Jesus both died brutal deaths, that's perhaps about the only point that is in common between those two kings. And yet in the death of Saul, Many Israelites died. But the difference is this. In the death of Jesus, many are made alive through the baptism of their own death into that of Jesus Christ. And of all men, Jesus of Nazareth was the man after God's own heart. He was the man that David typified and for Jesus, it was a resurrection to a new life where the power of sin, the power of the influences and the weaknesses of the flesh were not part of his life, his existence. And dear Alison, as you set out upon this road uh, to serve God, to serve your brothers and sisters, <clears throat> it's important for all of us to realize that it's the faithful who will be saved by the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, dear brothers and sisters and Alison, friends, young people, that all of us will be with the righteous 
who will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Amen. <laughs>